Um, thank you, Christian. Um, perhaps before I start, I could just ask who in the room is involved in designing any sort of, or planning or designing any sort of space? Yeah? And is anyone involved in, particularly in public space, designing public space? Okay, so this is one. Okay. Um, so I'm very grateful for Christian um, for asking me to talk tonight. Here I was on holiday having not a care in the world, and then Christian comes and says, how about doing a seminar on urban space, public space? So, um, yeah, I was very happy to do it. Um, and I think over the years Christian has heard me, um, Christian has heard me complaining so much about um, many places that we have visited. Um, I think it's, he probably thought, well, time to put your money where your mouth is and start to say, well, how could, how could we improve these places? So, um, if, we've got any, if you've got any questions as we go through, um, I think Christian's going to give you some cards just to note them down and we'll talk about them after, okay? Um, during the question and answer. If you have any difficulties with my Australian English, um, put your hand up and I'll try and talk slowly or explain it, what I've just said because um, uh, I realise sometimes I speak very quickly. So, okay, so we'll just start. Um, we can get this to happen. Achso, ja, erzählen. Andere Präsentation. So, warte, warte, warte. So, um, what I've entitled this talk is Maximizing Individual and Social Wellbeing in, in Public Space. And I've used this, um, this picture, this is Bebelplatz here in Berlin, um, not as a criticism, I understand it's a very significant public space with the book, uh, the book Burning Memorial there, but just to show you, apart from the memorial, there's nothing happening. There's no other reason for being there other than to visit the memorial or to walk through. Okay, so if you keep this space in mind, just in terms of a concept, not as a criticism of Bebelplatz, but just in terms of concept of, of an empty space that is in the middle of a very busy city, right next to a very busy and very well-known main, main thoroughfare. Okay, it's an interesting, there's institutions around at the opera, I think this is a hotel behind here, the big cathedral, the um, library from the, the university, um, but there's nothing happening in that space. You ask yourself, when was the last time I visited? Did I ever say to friends, let's meet at Babelplatz and do something? Probably not. Okay. So, um, as a concept, just keep that in the back of your head. So, in terms of what we're doing tonight, um, we're talking about the importance of public space for individual well-being. Now that falls within the very large area of quality of life and livability, but by bringing it down to individual well-being, we can relate that better to public space. Okay? Um, we're going to be talking about the di different types of public space. We spend most of our lives, when we're not indoors, in public space. Okay? So there's a, a range of different types that, that we can think about. We're going to be talking about as an overview, um, planning and designing public spaces. It's a massive area, of course, and I've got a few minutes to do it. But um, I think there's some interesting perspectives I can, I can talk about here. Um, based on a case study, Pyramid Park, which is a new park that um, the people for Places and Spaces, myself in particular, was involved in um, from the outset. So um, we can start to apply some of the issues that we'll be talking about in this, in this case study. And um, after, after the Pyramid Park, we'll just look at Bryant Park in New York. Does anyone know Bryant Park? Okay, um, it's a fabulous space, we'll talk about it, we'll talk about it after. And I've used two parks because it's actually interesting, they're, they're complex spaces. And if you can design a park, um, you can design any public space. The principles work for anywhere. So, it's worthwhile um, looking at them because um, we can apply that princi those principles anywhere. Then we're going to have a little group activity um, based on a local Berlin um, space that you would probably know, I'm sure. And then I think we've got questions and answers and then drinks and discussions. Okay? So it's a fairly 
There's fairly a lot to get through, so I'll move fairly quickly. And I hope I don't talk too fast. Um, so in terms of individual well-being, I like this diagram. I pinched it from the University of Michigan um, because it expands on what well-being is. And these factors do work well in the public space. We've got our physical well-being, how healthy we are. Um, that's clear. But our emotional and mental well-being, okay, has aspects and relationships to public space. The environmental aspect, not just green and, and, um, and that, but in terms of the, the whole environment, what we experience when we're in a public space. Things like noise, things like crowding, those sorts of issues are important. Financial, occupational well-being, um, that can also have a, a meaning in public space. The social, of course, whether we're introvert, extrovert, um, we all have social needs and we spend most of our time outside, well, depending on the weather, um, and the public space can really fulfil a lot of those sorts of requirements that we have. Intellectual well-being even in public space and spiritual, not religious or even new age, but just sitting, looking, watching people, watching the sky, watching the sea, being in green space, that's all part of it. So in terms of well-being, um, if we think of that kind of in an expanded way, um, I think that's a good entree into public space. So good public spaces are really good social spaces. Okay? Uh, and what we're trying to do is increase the number of human interactions in public space, economic reaction, uh, reactions, social interactions, environmental interactions. And if we do that, we can increase personal and social well-being. Okay? Now, thinking back to Babel Platz, no reason for being there other than the memorial. Um, therefore, individual, good, individual public spaces thrive when they invite people in, okay? by providing them multiple reasons for being there and reasons to return often. That's the basic premise that I'll be talking about. Trying to program public spaces to provide people reasons to be, okay? and reasons to increase these interactions and to foster their well-being. So there are different types of public spaces, clearly, in towns and cities. Um, these may or may not be all applicable in every city, but we have a rough equivalent in most places. So large regional centres, which include shopping malls, airports, train stations, cruise passenger terminals. They are all public spaces. Town centres, neighbourhood centres, main streets, the British call them high streets, um, all other streets, even laneways. And I'll show you a picture of a laneway shortly, which is a, a good space. Civic squares and spaces in between buildings. Often they're just empty. Um, and they can be activated. For, for humans. Parks, of course, are wonderful public spaces. So how much public space is really public? In town centres, civic squares, parks, streets, laneways, they're generally accessible 24-7. There's societal rules for behaviour, few regulations, and no or little formal security, okay? So that's a, a typical open public space that we, we talk about. Then we get down to semi-public space. So in terms of malls, airports, train stations, um, they all are accessible to everybody, but we start to get then restrictions and conditions. Okay? Um, there's maybe time-based restrictions. The space is certainly regulated. Okay? Um, and we find a, a lot higher levels of security, medium to high security generally, in semi-public space. Then we have semi-private space. Okay, an office building is a classic example, or perhaps even a museum, where it's accessible to fewer people. You can still go in there, but you have to have more of a reason to be there. Okay? So there's more time-based restrictions, the space is more heavily regulated, and we've got medium or even quite high security. Now I'll go through some I'll go through some pictures. This is interesting. Um, Christian gave this to me. That's a park in Haifa. Okay, it's got all the elements that look fabulous. Um, sun, grass, places to sit, walkway, views of the water, lighting for night. There's nobody there. 
I said to Kristen, where, where are all the people? <laughs> and he said, well, you know, it's on the top of a hill and half is full of old people and so they can't walk up there. <laughs> so, so, what, like, is that a fail? Like, here's a public space, a great space, but it actually doesn't work for, work for the people who live there. Um, it's an interesting, an interesting point, and I'm glad you, you gave me that slide because um, I think it says a lot. Great design, but we forgot someone. Um, typical street in Asia, this looks a bit like Hong Kong perhaps, um, probably 20 out of 24 hours a day, busy, busy, people interacting, all sorts of human transactions going on. Um, I would say that these people have a very high sense of well-being because they can do most of the things they want to do here on the street in Hong Kong. That's a very particularly Asian thing, but it's also applicable to other streets. This is interesting, a uh, public space in Melbourne, a laneway called Hosier Lane. Um, it's like this probably 18, 20, maybe even 24 hours a day. Um, and it, it's just a laneway. Um, I think Berliners would feel very comfortable here. There's lots of graffiti, um, lots of street art, and it's regularly replaced. So the artists are encouraged to, I think they have a maximum of two weeks or a month to have their work of art there, and then someone comes along and paints over it. But look who's here. There's families, there's young people, people just sitting on the, the curb, um, sitting in doorways, there's coffee, food, and it's, it's a great space, and it's a very simple space. And look also behind here is a very formal public space, Federation Square in Melbourne, and they sit very comfortably together. Okay? So, um, I think that's one that works, works really well and it's really, really simple. So public spaces don't have to be complex. It's, it's what you do in them that makes the, the space um, interesting. This is interesting. Unter den Linden here in Berlin. Um, totally public street, but is it a private takeover? You find this everywhere. Two thirds of the public sidewalk is, has been privatised by a really crummy cafe. Um, you can basically walk two abreast down the side. Um, it's within what I would call a highly significant space between the Russian Embassy here and the Brandenburg Tour and maybe 150 metres and yet it's a crappy cafe. And you see it everywhere. Just look as you walk on, not just here, of course, but anywhere you go, you'll find the same thing time and again. Private takeover, the, the, the city's earning money, obviously, from the tables out here, and yet um, in a significant space like this, which I think is Berlin's biggest tourist attraction, the Brandenburg Gate, something like that. A semi-public space, an airport, um, quite often they turn into shopping malls, some airports you can actually shop land side as well as air side. Um, and um, these require planning as well in exactly the same way that I'll be talking about. Another semi-public space, Grand Central Station in New York. Fabulous. Wonderful. There's shopping under the archways, there's restaurants, there's <coughs> delis. It's a fantastic place. But don't go to a deli or, or a liquor store and buy food and then roll out your rug and try and sit in the sun here because you won't be allowed to. Again, it's regulated. Okay. So, um, a fabulous space, but there are different rules for some public spaces. This is interesting. This is um, an office lobby in Sydney. Um, anyone can go in there, but you can only go this far. Can't go upstairs. There's seating in here. Um, obviously, people are, this is the quiet time, people are upstairs working, um, but that's all you can do. So it's really a semi-private space. But this is changing. In Sydney at least, and Melbourne I guess, I don't know about other cities, office spaces are opening up their semi-private space and become semi-public space. This is a cafe that's installed in that empty space. Anyone can go in there. So you can walk past, get a great coffee, something to eat, and suddenly you've got more choices than you had when this was semi-private. This is happening again, small, uh, small lobby, pop-up space here. Um, 
look, there's four people working there. Employment, um, people coming off the street, people coming from downstairs. There's a few little small tables and chairs to sit. So again, you can be walking past that building, uh, whereas before you would never have gone in, suddenly it's opening up to become um, a semi-public space, which is fabulous because as our cities get busier, as there's more tourists coming, there are more choices. And it's creating employment and well-being. So, that's just a run through of the different types of public spaces you might encounter. Now, I'm just going to look quickly at issues related to planning and designing public spaces. Um, I don't have a lot of time, but we'll, we'll, we'll go through it. Um, so, what are some questions to increase individual well-being in public spaces? Well, clearly, who uses the public space, but who doesn't? Why don't they use it? Think back to the park in Haifa. Someone didn't find out that old people weren't using that space or weren't, weren't capable of using the space. And you end up with a lovely park, but old people can't get to it. Okay? So this is often forgotten, who doesn't use the space. And it's very, very important. So which new uses, activities, facilities could work well in the space? Um, how could the space interact with nearby businesses, elements, to increase economic, social, environmental benefits? Okay. Are there any programmed activities or events that could be appropriate in that space? Can design elements accommodate event and non-event modes, or activity and non-activity modes? And we'll talk about this more as we look at the case. Time factors. Is it a day-only space? Is it a day-night space? Does it operate like that laneway in Melbourne, basically 24 hours a day, every day of the year? Um, are there seasonal modes? All of these questions come into, into being. So, what I find very useful is to use a metaphor to start to reframe these questions. Um, and it's actually quite easy, and I hope... I hope you find it useful. Any public space is really just a stage. Okay? And as a stage, it has a variety of actors and performances. But the stage is public space, or a series of public spaces that can host a range of activities. The actors are the stakeholders of the public space. So in other words, the residents, people who work there, students who study there, visitors, local and international, local businesses, investors, um, could also say public institutions that maybe surround the space. So you really need to start to ask these people um, what do they think about the space and now and how would they want to use it in the future. And then you start to get an amazing kind of um, set of responses if you ask them. The performances, what activities and uses do they want to do there? What uses and features and facilities are missing which would help them to achieve those activities and performances the stakeholders want to do? So suddenly we've basically reframed all those previous questions simply by using the metaphor of the stage, the actors and the performances. And if you ask those questions correctly, you'll get the right answers every single time. So now I'm going to move on to the case study of Pyramid Park on Sydney Harbour. This encapsulates a lot of what we've just been talking about. This is the picture of the park in 2005, which is actually just a dock. That's all it was. Um, a water police dock, which was transformed from 2005 to 2010 into a multi-award winning park. Okay. This is important, the, go the governance model, um, it's public ownership, it's owned by the City of Sydney, it's publicly funded by the City of Sydney, and it's managed by the City of Sydney. There are other models that, that you can look at, and I'll show you one of those as well. So just to give you some orientation, um, I don't know if you know Sydney, but here's Pyramid Park, it's to the west of the Harbour Bridge. Here's the Harbour Bridge here. 
and it's about from here to the coast is about 15 kilometers. So it's really inner harbour. Okay. Um, that's a residential area around here. This is a redevelopment site from an old industrial estate, um, but this is pretty much residential. And here's the main the main city, um, which you can't really see from here because of the city is very hilly. So that's the side. There's the top of the Harbour Bridge, um, and that's all it was. It was just a dock for police boats. I guess they used to do a bit of admin here and have their uh, change rooms, etc., showers, etc. So it had an unfortunate beginning, 2003. The New South Wales government wants to redevelop into luxury apartments and small open space, so they had a design competition. Okay, um, they got three design options from architects. They showed the people, they were all rejected. I actually went to the competition purely by accident because I didn't know I'd be working on the space. So it was quite fortunate. Um, and you had a lot of middle class people being very angry um, when they were shown what was coming their way. So there were significant protests and in the end, 2004, the, the state government said, fine, we'll get rid of it. City of Sydney said, yes, please. They bought the site for 11 million and embarked on a new project to develop a park for the people. So a new approach was undertaken. Um, our company won a public tender to plan the visioning phase and to integrate that with the design phase. Um, of the, the whole process. So we worked for the city, not for the architects. Okay? That's, that was quite important. Um, we started phase one with a blank sheet of paper. We said to the city, don't do any drawings, don't present them with any options, because everyone will just think, oh well, you've decided, why talk to us? Okay? So we said, a blank sheet of paper, ask people what they want. So we did visioning with residents, near and far, and that was important too. Um, school students, visitors, local businesses, interviews, self-completion, questionnaires, visioning workshops, guided walks and discussions. About 500 people took part in that. It's a big job, but if you want to do it properly, you've got to use those numbers. You've got to work with large numbers, so you get a very strong sample size. It's all qualitative data. We're not, we're not using quant surveys. It's all qualitative. We're listening to people's ideas for their aspirations for the site. So big data analysis and report writing. The report, report was published online. Copies were put in the local area, um, in the lobbies of some of the apartment blocks, so people could read what was said. Because, again, it's important for them to understand the, the ideas that were coming out. Phase two began early in 2006, the <coughs> design process. So up till now, nothing had been designed. Um, following evaluation, there was a feedback loop with people, what you told us, and on the basis of what they told us, there were eight very high-level overarching principles that were, um, that were designed and tested um, that came out of the phase one outcomes. I can't remember them all, but some of the important ones were allowing users to engage with the water. This was incredibly important. And I'll talk a little bit about how it came out in the design. Um, retain all the existing sight lines and views. Retain and integrate the heritage features of the site because before the water police were there, there were other industrial uses that people wanted to remember in the site. And provide facilities for all age groups. So there were four of the eight really strong high level principles. So, on the, basis, on the basis of those eight design principles, three options were developed of how the park might look, which responded differently to each of those principles. We then had iterative design workshops, open air displays for testing the three options. And at that point, we got about 300 participants. Um, a lot of the other 500 were visitors to the area um, because there, is, there was an existing park there around the point around the corner that people used um, and they fell away because it wasn't convenient for them to come to workshops etc all the time. So we basically started to get down to a core group of local 
local people. Um, we evaluated all of the uh, workshop data, and again, all the reports were published. And then phase three began probably a year later, in 2006, um, where the preferred design was presented. Um, designing was going on as the data was being made available, options were being developed, and um, the third design came in, um, sorry, late 2006. Um, so they were based on the, 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 the phase two outcomes. Um, we, owned, we not only gave them drawing plans, Remembering a lot of people can't read plans because it's two-dimensional and they can't see it. So a 3D model, a large 3D model was built. Very expensive, but once people saw the model, they understood what was going on. So, so it really helped our case to, to um, show the design in a three-dimensional way. So um, presentation took place around about... 2006, and we, um, November 2006, and we got down to about 250 participants. And at that point, in this phase three, we weren't inviting new people in because the designing process had gone on for so long that we couldn't accommodate new ideas at that point. So basically, we came down to a core group of about 250 people. So the outcomes, the final design was approved by 84% of the people. The city of Sydney had never had such a high... Um, sign off from its, uh, its residents and ratepayers. Council approved the design very early in 2007, got on with the design documentation phase, construction began late in 2007. The park was opened in February 2010, got 26 million to build, which is a bargain in today's money. Um, it became a multi award winning park for both the design and the process, and the design process. Um, it basically opened 24-7, 365, and I'll show you some photos of the park. So it went from the, the police dock to this. Um, and there's another, these were taken just before it opened, by the way. Um, so you've got a whole range of activities, and I've written it down just so I can read them out, um, that cover all of the age groups. So this was really important, this artificial bay, because people said, we want to engage with the water, we want to touch the water. And at this part of Sydney Harbour, which is the inner harbour, mostly you can't, because people always say, oh, the water's too dirty, you can't let people near the water. So you can see the water's actually quite clean. Um, Sydney Harbour has been cleaned up over the last 20 years. Um, all the industry has been moved away. Um, this almost didn't happen. This is what people wanted most. The landscape designers were saying, no, the water's too dirty, we can't let them anywhere near it, it's too dangerous. We'll put a little stream through the park. So they had a little thing like that with water about that deep running through the park. And a long story short, we pushed and pushed the city, we were working for the city, not the, not the architects. We pushed the city and said, no, people want something like this. They want a bay. They don't want a stream. Okay? So after a lot of to and fro water testing, water quality testing analysis, um, the landscape architects finally agreed to this wonderful thing. And it's designed for kids. You can see this, this pan here for tons of kids. Um, it's a little bit deeper here for adults. Um, I think this is at the high tide. We don't get that many high tides in Sydney, but um, the water's come up a significant level here. Um, but it's designed so it's not a pool, you can't swim in it, you don't need a lifeguard. Okay? It's self-regulated. Okay? So that was an, an amazing outcome that actually almost didn't happen. And it only happened because the people were persistent and because we were persistent in, in, in pushing the city to go ahead and do it. Other features of the park that are kind of hidden away in here, um, barbecue area, a kids' playground, kids' water play, the water spurts up and they go, can go running through it. Um, walkway, cycleway, shaded spaces, there's a, um, a cafe in there as well um, that provides business opportunity, of course, and local employment. Um, the benches, all the benches that are kind of in here were made from the timbers, from the docks. So that kept uh, some local heritage going. 
Over here, you just can't see it. There's what they call a pole garden, which are some of the old poles that were used to hold up the docks are represented there. Um, there's a water taxi dock. So you can call a water taxi and jump on that and go into the city if you want to. Um, the park is accessible from above. Um, up here on the, the higher level, there's a lot of social housing. And actually the people in the expensive housing down here didn't want those people in the park. So it was a battle, but the architects won. And there's, you can just see the beginning of it here, steps coming down. And there's a lot of car parking up there as well. And the people around the park said, oh, we don't want people parking and using our park. And, and in fact, the, the local people didn't want any of this. They just wanted the green space. They didn't want to attract anyone to come and use the park apart from themselves. So it was a balancing act between what the visitors wanted, what the local people wanted, and etc. And the park is also integrated into a, a 14 kilometre foreshore walk around the harbour. So, the only thing that didn't happen, um, which the council wanted and the architects wanted, was they wanted to have a community hub building going around the corner here, two-storey building, which would host community activities, kids' activities, community meetings, other sorts of things. The consultation said, no, we're not want to. We don't want a community hub. And the council said, okay, we won't put one in. Um, Fine. Lots of people, they got what they asked for, basically. So that's Pyramid Park. Um, the lessons from Pyramid Park in terms of design and planning process are significant. Um, I think the issue is the more significant the space, the more democratic the planning process has to be. So that leads to a vision-led process Pyramid Park was, a, was really a highly democratic process from the bottom up. It wasn't the top down with the designers saying, this is, what, this is what you're going to get, you comment on it. Again, it was from the bottom up. Okay? Um, the importance of beginning with that blank sheet of paper, not taking a design to them, but saying to them, well, you tell us what you want, and then we'll go away and we'll design something. Um, Leave no stone unturned in the process. Everyone is welcome to participate, invite individuals, not groups. Of course, there were several community groups here that formed as part of the protest action. Um, and they were very, very strong. That comes down to the urban sociology of the area. And they said, oh, we, look, we, no need to have all this consultation. We know what people want. So just talk to us. Yeah. Of course, They've got their own politics, they've got their own agendas. Um, so, yes, of course we talked to them, and we were very respectful of them, but we also invited every single individual we could find. As I said, visitors, students, local businesses. So it was a combination of talking to the group, being very kind to them, but saying, OK, there's a whole lot of other people we need to speak to as well. We would have had a very different outcome if we just talked to those people. Um, again, the criti critical importance of establishing a multi-stage process where the design can evolve and you can bring people along in that evolution, okay? Um, and where that process is interlinked with the consultation, the actors, and the planning and design teams. Also incredibly important. <coughs> and this also, the critical importance of establishing, at the very beginning, establishing um, the overarching principles, okay? That will guide the whole process. As I said, if we didn't understand what people actually meant by we want to engage with the water, we want to touch the water, they would have ended up with a little river to the park. So that overarching principle of engage with the water and understanding what they meant by that. The city didn't understand that. They said, oh, well, there's a river through it. That's fine. That's all we need. No, that's not what they need. We took the data to the city. We said, this is what they want. And they read it and they said, oh, okay, right. So what do we do? Back to the drawing board. Okay. So these are overarching principles that are always critical. Do them first, do them at the beginning. And then let them fall in the design 
as they will. Okay, very quickly, um, an outlook bright park in New York City. I think this is the world's most perfect park. I saw it for the first time last year. Um, my previous boss talked about it for 17 years that I worked there. And I thought, oh, I'm not Bryant Park again. Shut up already. Um, but it really is the most wonderful space that you can imagine. Um, ooh. All right. Okay. Um, I thought we'd get no, it's coming down. Um, okay. Now, a different governance model. Um, it's a publicly owned park, but it's run by a private management company and it's financially completely self-funded. The City of New York pays not a penny into Bryant Park. Um, this is what's called a business improvement district. They have lots of them in America. Um, and it, in fact, the local businesses pay for the park. They, they buy into the business improvement district and then the park supports itself with um, income from the various cafes and bars and restaurants in Bryant Park. So here it is, um, surrounded by skyscrapers. I don't know how any sun gets in there, but it does. Um, you've got sun there. Um, you can do whatever you want there, and you can have complete privacy. Stuff's going on in all parts of the park, and you're not even aware of it. That's how good this place is. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, the history, it was dysfunctional prior to 1980, full of drug addicts, antisocial activities. The Bryant Park Corporation was formed in 1980 as a not-for-profit um, to fix the problems. They commenced the four-year innovation in 1988. It reopened in 1992, as you see now, as it is now. Um, they had six times the funding of the previous public funding, and it's the largest public funded, a privately funded park in the USA. Um, it's now regarded as, well, everyone just loves it. Visitors and locals alike, New York's town square. So features of Bryant Park, 3.6 hectares of open space, surrounded by skyscrapers. Movable chairs to sit alone in groups, sun or shade. Many, many food and coffee possibilities, but this is the thing. Over 1,000 free activities and events annually. Nobody pays anything to participate in any of the events in Bryant Park. This is a range of events that happens on a single day. If you go to their website, it's mind-boggling what you can do in Bryant Park. There's yoga, there's story time, there's trivia night, juggling, book club, waste sorting, juggling, yoga, piano, knitting, social games, tai chi. Um, and these activities go on maybe 18 hours a day. And they're all happening around the park. And you, you can sit there and feel like the place is yours. It's quite extraordinary. Um, they also have movie night. So everyone sits on the grass, they put up a big screen and they watch movies. It's just amazing. This is what you can do when you've got very advanced planning and management of, of public spaces. Okay?